Hello and welcome to Void Electronics. In today's video I would like to show you an apparently simple circuit that is actually not so simple once you get into the details of it. I'm talking about the classic one transistor blinker circuit that was featured in so many online videos, however most of them fail to explain how it works and of course why it's a big deal, so let's get into it. When talking about LED blinkers, people usually talk about the classic A-stable multivibrator circuit. This one employs two transistors, so people naturally wondered if this could be made with a single transistor. And it turns out making it with a single transistor is a pretty difficult task, and that's because it's pretty hard to pull off such a low frequency oscillator using a single transistor. So people had to get creative. And here's the circuit we are talking about today which actually works using a single transistor and just a few components around it. So we have like five components in total. Let's have a quick look at the schematic. Here it is, and uh, the more you look at it, the weirder it gets. <laughs> look at this. First of all, we have an NPN transistor here, and it is not connected in a way that you would expect. As you can see, current flows through this transistor in reverse. So we have a positive voltage here, that goes into the emitter and out of the collector, which is strange. And um, not only that, but as you can see, the base is not even connected here. So how is it even possible that this transistor conducts and that the LED ever turns on? Strange, right? The only plausible explanation here is that the transistor exhibits negative differential resistance and this forms a relaxation oscillator. So what happens here is that C1 charges through R1 here until it reaches a voltage when this transistor conducts somehow. Once it conducts, it flashes the LED, it uh, discharges the capacitor really quickly and the cycle repeats, which means that this is a relaxation oscillator. Now we also have another resistor here called R2 and its purpose is to limit the discharge current, presumably so that you don't kill the LED during the discharge phase of this uh, sequence. So with this explanation in mind, this circuit may look a bit more conventional. However, don't forget that uh, this region is not specified in the transistor datasheet, meaning that uh, no manufacturer can guarantee any parameter that uh, will actually make this circuit work. So we have to dig even deeper, I would say. When working with bipolar transistors, we usually bias them in a region that we call the forward active region, which makes it useful for amplifiers. What this means is that the base is positive with respect to the emitter at around 600 to 700 millivolts, and we also bias the collector at a much higher voltage than the base and the emitter. This takes us to the forward active region, which is useful for amplifiers, but this is definitely not what happens in our circuit, and that's because the emitter is positive with respect to the collector. So this is not something that is usually taught at school, so we need to take a deeper look inside to see what happens here. And to understand this, we have to understand the internal structure of the transistor. If you were to check it with a multimeter, this is what you would notice. You would observe a base emitter junction, which looks like a diode, and you would also observe another junction between the base and the collector which are arranged like so. Needless to say, if you take two diodes and you connect them in this configuration, you don't get a transistor, and that's because the interaction between these two junctions makes the transistor work as a transistor, which means that there is some magic inside that uh, needs to be explained before um, understanding this structure. So let's have a look uh, at that as well, and here it is. This is our typical epitaxial transistor, and um, these are the layers involved in all this magic. What happens here is that we have an N-type substrate. Um, on top of this substrate, we deposit an N-type layer, which is called the epitaxial layer. And inside this epitaxial layer, we have two diffusions that form the NPN transistor. But we need to remember what a diode is. A typical semiconductor diode is a PN junction, and as you can see right here, we have two such junctions. That's because the base region, which is a P-type semiconductor, is in the middle between the emitter and the collector. And this forms the two junctions from the previous figure. 
I hope it makes more sense now. With this picture in mind, we can explain what happens in our circuit at least partially. In our circuit, the emitter is positive with respect to the collector, so you tend to believe that there is no good reason why current would flow in reverse, right? Because this um, diode or this junction is reverse biased, so it has no good reasons to conduct current, right? Well, not really. That's because in the case of bipolar transistors, uh, the base emitter junction can only take around 7 volts in reverse before it breaks down. And uh, our circuit works at around 14 volts, so we have plenty of voltage to break down the base emitter junction. Which means that this uh, junction works pretty much like a Zener diode in our case. And if it does work like a Zener diode, that means that current will flow at least um, up to this point. But here, as you can see, if you make this uh, point positive, then the base will also be positive with respect to the collector, meaning that uh, the base collector junction will be forward biased and this would allow current to flow through the transistor. So at least this explains why the LED turns on, but it doesn't explain why it blinks. So this means that we have to dig even deeper in order to understand this. In order to dig deeper, we have to use the curve tracer. I've explained what this is in a separate video that you'll find in the description. So let's just put it simply, this is a piece of test equipment that applies some test voltages and the base current in order to characterize the transistor and get the IV curves between the collector current and the collector to emitter voltage. Something like this. This is what the forward active region looks like and this device also allows you to compare between two transistors which are um, inside this fixture. However, this is not the region that we're interested in today, so we have to reconfigure it. So to replicate the conditions in our circuit, first of all the base needs to be open circuit. Fortunately, I have this setting on this curve tracer. Then we need to apply a negative voltage between a collector and emitter, and we also have this setting. And then we need to apply a larger voltage, maybe we could go to something like 2 volts per division to start with. We have to reduce the um, series resistor with this setting and then we need to move the dot somewhere to the to the up and right corner something like this and then let's see what we get we should get the breakdown region of the base emitter junction i think we are ready now let's increase the voltage and see what we get we are at two volts four six 8, 10, and here's where things get interesting. As you can see, uh, the base emitter junction is breaking down and it has a really weird characteristic. So it has a tip here and then it goes to the right, which is a really weird thing to do because in this region here, as we are increasing the current, the voltage across the base emitter junction decreases, meaning that it has negative differential resistance. And this is the key property that makes this oscillator work. That's because as the capacitor charges up, um, the voltage goes higher and higher and higher until the transistor breaks down, so we are somewhere around here. This makes the transistor conduct, so we are somewhere around here. And once this happens, the voltage decreases, so we are back to where we started. And the cycle repeats. In order for this to work, we really need to have negative differential resistance, otherwise the transistor will break down and it will just stay on. And strangely enough, not all transistors exhibit this behavior. For example, here we have a 2N2222. And as you can see, of course it breaks down but it doesn't really have a negative differential resistance. The characteristic is almost straight down. So in theory, this transistor shouldn't work in this circuit, right? We have to test this as well. It looks like we really need to use the transistor which is in the original article, which is a BC547. So now is the moment of truth. Does this circuit work with a transistor that doesn't exhibit the negative resistance behavior? Let's see, this is the BC547 and this is the 2N2222 which goes in like this because it has a different pinout. Let's see, 3, 2, 1, 
yes, it doesn't work, so we got it. This one doesn't have the negative differential resistance, so the LED stays on forever. However, even if you have the right transistor in place, you will never be able to mass produce a circuit like this, and that's because this property is not in the datasheet. And if it's not specified, this means that in theory you could buy a transistor that doesn't exhibit this behavior from the manufacturer and it will still be within spec. And yes, things like this have happened and they are documented in, in a book called Troubleshooting Analog Circuits by Bob Pease. I highly recommend reading that book. And in case you're wondering, here's what the waveform looks like across the transistor. It pretty much checks out what we saw on the curve tracer. So the voltage rises all the way up to around 11.4 volts and it discharges the capacitor down to around 10.4 volts, which gives us around uh, 1 volt of hysteresis, which pretty much checks out with what we saw on the curve tracer. I wanted to dig even deeper to find out which of these junctions exhibit negative differential resistance. The negatively biased base emitter junction or the forward biased base collector junction. And guess what? None of them exhibit negative differential resistance on their own. Which means that it's the interaction between these two junctions that create this behavior and this is pretty much all I know about this circuit. I have no idea what is the root cause of this phenomena. So yeah, this pretty much concludes this video and please let me know if you expected such a simple circuit to actually be so difficult to analyze, because I certainly didn't. I stumbled across this because a friend of mine sent me the schematic and he also told me that he had trouble making it work. That was because he was using a different transistor to what the author used. So I tried to replicate the circuit and I reached all these conclusions on my own and I really wanted to share these conclusions with him in the first place and also with you guys. So please let me know if you found out anything new in this video. Don't forget that you can support this community by giving me a super thanks or by joining me on YouTube. And that's about it. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you're interested in more content related to electronics and programming, please subscribe to this channel because there is more content like this on the way. That's it for now. Bye.